to elections to different directions. Last week, countries on opposite ends of the planet voted in new leadership. While Poland moved left, uprooting almost a decade of often controversial right-wing rule, Ecuador chose the right, ushering in the young son of a billionaire magnate. We'll look at where their choices could take their countries. I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. Many polls, along with EU leaders in Brussels, celebrated after Poland's election saw left-wing parties come closer to edging out eight years of nationalist conservative rule. Though the PIS, or Law and Justice Party, did claim more seats than any other, three left-wing movements won a combined parliamentary majority. So, if the civic coalition, the left, and the third way are able to form a coalition, they could turn Poland's anti-EU conservative direction 180 degrees. Well, let's look now at what changed under eight years of Law and Justice Party rule and what a new coalition might just reverse. A record turnout for a landmark vote. Almost 74% of the Polish population voted to change the country's direction on October 15th. The Civic Coalition the left and third way alliances took hold of 54% of the votes, and they are likely to form a coalition government. Mr. President, there is nothing to wait for. If you need to hear, as part of the consultations, whether there is a majority in parliament to form a government, we inform you that there is a majority. There is no need to delay, to think, to hesitate. It's the end of the road for the Law and Justice Party, which has been in power for the past eight years. Pundits say its leader Jaroslaw Kaczynski neglected Polish youth at this year's campaign, and it cost him dearly, since that demographic ended up being the decisive majority. Many laws passed by the government still caused controversy, however, like one that allowed exposing Russian influence in Polish politics. But when the US and the EU claimed that bill could also be used against rival party officials, it was amended. And there's the 2018 law, which allows the government to dismiss judges critical of ruling party reforms. All that didn't go down well with the EU. The union has often come into conflict with the party. That antagonistic relationship could change now. Some believe Poland will leave the populist rhetoric behind and turn into a liberal democracy. Others, however, argue that with the Law and Justice Party still having players within bureaucracy and the media, that sentiment is nothing but a daydream. So will this election really bring change to Poland? Joining me now to discuss that is from Brighton in the UK, Professor of Politics and Contemporary European Studies at the University of Sussex, Alex Sherbiak. Thanks so much for being with us, Alex. You know, I'm wondering if part of the media's interpretation of this election actually oversimplifies things, because saying a coalition of the left has won and can now reverse Poland's direction might sound very logical, but you've been arguing it won't be so straightforward. So why? Yes, that's right. Because, well, first of all, it's not simply a coalition of the left. It's actually a very broad coalition that ranges through from quite moderate social conservative agrarians through liberals, through right through to the radical left. Um, and the one thing that, that unites them um, was that they wanted to get rid of law and justice, basically. So this is going to be a difficult coalition to try and put together a coherent governing program, both in terms of economic issues and moral cultural issues like abortion. The other problem they face is that they will um, be up against a president um, who's in office until 2025, who is a supporter of the um, Law and Justice Party, the outgoing government, and who can veto their legislation. And, they'll, and they would need a 60% majority in parliament to overturn that. And they currently don't have that. In fact, they're, they're not even close to it. And also, he could refer their legislation to a body called the Constitutional Tribunal which can strike down the laws or simply just leave them in limbo. And every single member of this body, all 15 of them, were elected um, 
during the time that law and justice was in office. So these are all things that's going to make it quite difficult. Anything that really requires legislation is going to be very, very difficult for the government to get through. What do you envision, though? I mean, are you feeling at least slightly optimistic or do you think this could unfold in a more chaotic fashion? Well, I think what will happen is that um, there'll be a lot of uh, emphasis on elite turnover um, in terms of public appointments. There will be a big shake up in terms of um, the civil service, public administration, state owned companies, government supervisory bodies, these kind of things, because these are the kind of things that are easy to change. Um, especially if they don't require legislation. And also, it's the sort of thing that, that very diverse, ideologically diverse groups of, of parties can agree about. They can all agree about the, the spoils of office. Where I think it's going to get messy is where the government tries to introduce changes. Um, and there might be legislation required, but where they try and get round it. A good example of this is Polish state television, um, which is currently controlled by, by a management that's very sympathetic to law and justice, the outgoing government. They would really like to change the management of this. Um, a lot of people say legislation is required to do this, um, but they might try and find a way around it, mm. uh, which doesn't require legislation, like, okay. for example, declaring okay. the company bankrupt. And I think that's where the problem's going to be. They might find that they try and go for the kind of shortcuts in order to achieve change they want that they criticise the outgoing government for. Oh, interesting. Alex, so, you know, we, we do have to remember that PIS still won more votes than any other single party. So what does that really say? about how conservative a lot of Polish people still are. Yes, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And um, the fact that this is a party that's been in office for eight years and still was able to emerge as the largest single party, still win 35% of the vote, shows that there is um, still a considerable um, base of support for the kind of ideas that, that they're putting forward, the critique of the, of the Polish state that they argued and of its elites and institutions. Um, and of the social values that they represent. And I think uh, the testament to this is that the um, the opposition parties actually had to adopt a lot of their rhetoric and a lot of their policies in order to get elected on issues like migration. And again, I think this is going to create a problem because they, on, on a lot of these issues, they would really like to backtrack. They, they didn't want to say a lot of the things that they said. Um, and of course, if they do that, and, and, and it looks like you know, on some of these things, they're already starting to backtrack a little mm. bit, that could then leave them open to the accusation that they simply said these things in order to get them elected. So I think that's right. I mean, I think although law and justice has lost, there's still a lot of support for a lot of the policies that they put forward. And this is also, I think, going to act as a constraint on the incoming government, on issues like migration, for example, where they had to take a very tough line, very tough rhetoric, in order not to be outflanked by law and justice. Indeed. OK, then, very quickly, when will we see a government formed? And do you think any new leadership will be able to get the funding that the EU has been holding back, uh, which would make a, a quite considerable difference to the Polish public and as far as the public budget is concerned? Well, if the president um, sticks to the constitutional terms that, that there are um, and gives law and justice the, an opportunity to form a government, the first opportunity, it might not be until the middle of December um, that, that we actually see a new government formed. If the president decides to give the opposition parties a chance to form the government, um, then it could be sooner than that. It could be the middle of November when the when the, when the um, parliament convenes. We don't know that yet. The, the president's currently holding meetings. His initial indication was he would give law and justice the first opportunity as the largest party. He may not keep that to, to that promise because they can't form a majority. The coronavirus funding is a really important issue. It's, it's going to become a very, very important issue in Poland, particularly with elections coming up, local elections in April and then European Parliament elections. I think this highlights the problem of the incoming government really well because it, it's, it's really committed to getting this funding. On, on, the problem here is that it, it looks like it actually requires legislation in order to get um, to pass the milestones that the European Commission has set. And the problem with getting legislation through, of course, is, as I said, President Andrzej Duda could veto it or refer it to the Constitutional Tribunal. Okay. And, okay. and on the other hand, if the Commission simply says, no, look, obviously this is a government that's that's committed to, to the rule of law, let's, let's just fast track this, this plays into the narrative that law and justice has been saying, which is that this is nothing to do with the rule of law, it's simply politically motivated, and now you have a change of government they're just going to give them the money. Alex Trebiak, great to have your analysis. Thanks so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers.
Thank you very much. Now, on the other side of the planet, the small South American state of Ecuador voted in completely new leadership following a campaign marred by violence. Just 10 days before the first round vote, candidate Fernando Villavicencio was shot dead. Seven men accused in his assassination were also murdered in prison a short time after. And all this amid a huge surge in crime nationwide, fueled by drug traffickers and related violence. Still, the poll was carried out transparently and two candidates were left on the ballot. One, a protege of former leftist president Rafael Correa. The other, the 35-year-old son of one of Ecuador's richest men. Banana Magnet, Alvaro Noboa, ran for president five times and lost, but his son, with very limited political experience, won by a comfortable margin at 52.6%. I'd like to thank all the people who have participated in this new political plan, a young and unexpected plan that's brought smiles back to our country, that will bring peace and education to our youth, that will create the employment so many of our people are looking for, to make families feel safe in their streets and to bring progress to a country that has all the resources to move forward. Tomorrow we start rebuilding a country that's been so brutally hit by violence, by corruption and by hate. Tomorrow your new president, Daniel Noboa, will work to deliver hope. Thank you so much. Inspiring words, but with so much inequality in the country that led to massive paralyzing protests just over a year ago, is this the president that can bring security and stability back to Ecuador? Well, joining me now to discuss that and more are from Guatemala City, Manuela Pic, a professor of international relations at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. And from Quito, we have Esteban Ron Castro, a lawyer and dean at the SEC University of Ecuador. Thanks all so much for being with me. Manuela, we really should mention as well that this will be a truncated term. Noboa will only serve about 16 months because he's only completing former uh, President Guillermo Lasso's term after Lasso called a snap election you know, to avoid his impeachment. So he'll have a lot to prove in a pretty short time. Still though, Noboa's support grew from pretty tiny numbers, polling around 3%, to a very clear victory with 52%. So how did this kind of central right platform win over so many voters in those final months? Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary election in Ecuador and he will be in office for a very short time and he will arrive in office already running for the next campaign in a year. The, the, the event that marked this election in Ecuador was the assassination of one of the key candidates, Fernando Villavicencio, 10 days prior to the first round. And a few days after this assassination was the camp, the national debate. Noboa was a non-candidate with only 4% of the votes, uh, intended votes. And so he had a clear path to not fight with other candidates who were mm. competing to enter into the runoff. And he appeared as more neutral less stuck into the polarization between Correismo, anti-Correismo, and that gave him a platform to pass to the runoff. He won the runoff by not that many points, four or five percent, uh, ahead of it's the Correa candidate. I mean, many were surprised yes. that it was, it was a comfortable margin. I mean, do you think, though, people maybe felt safer taking a kind of risk on him because this term will be so short? I think most of all, he is a new face, even though he's, uh, he has been into politics, but he's a young candidate. He was not into the polarized debate, Correa, anti-Correa. And so the, it's an anti-polarization vote, right, that asks for something new and new proposals rather than the traditional debate between right and left represented by Correa. Mm. You know, Esteban, a huge part of his platform was about security. He's promising to tackle these record high crime rates, and he's actually hoping to join the army and the national police. He's proposing to put some of the most violent criminals on ships off the Pacific coast of Ecuador. What are you expecting from him as far as those kinds of promises are concerned? I mean, can he do that? Would, would that really work? Hey, good morning uh, to Manuela. Uh, hi, too. Uh, well, that's a, the, the, the most difficult part uh, of his government. Uh, you know, in Ecuador, security issues 
are one of the top uh, issues at the national uh, agenda. So uh, what's going to be happening with security? He has to make a lot of public uh, politics in order to uh, contain all the branches of criminal violence. The first one is the common violence that's happening nowadays in every city of the country. So he decided to uh, make a join between uh, army and, and police. Uh, another thing that he promised is that uh, he's going to be enforcing uh, all the plans and with an intelligent plan, uh, intelligence plan in the ports and airports. Uh, he's going to provide to Ecuador an intelligence unit to a specialized called Plan Phoenix. Uh, another thing that he, he, he promised is that he is going to enforce the law in order to make uh, um, some harder a, a crime, a, some harder a, a penalties. Punishment, uh, yeah. For, for punishments, yeah. For, for the for the crimes, but that's gonna be depending with the with the national assembly uh, mm. with the legislative branch. Do you yeah. think it will happen though? I mean, are his motives here sincere? Will he do something, even if it seems hard line? Will he get something done? He must do something mm. because uh, he just uh, well, it's gonna be a really short period. And he's looking for a re-election in 2025. So the, the first plan that he has to take a matter of is security. Uh, that's just uh, the main issue now in Ecuador. Okay, Manuela, you know, he's also pledged, you know, certain aspects of the economy, you know, how to improve the economy. He's promised more foreign investment. He's promised fewer taxes, Manuela, new businesses. I mean, do, do Ecuadorians want that and do people really trust him on economic policy given many believe his family's banana empire actually avoided paying a lot of taxes over the years yeah his family is the number one owing uh, taxes 80 million dollars in taxes unpaid to the government so we have little expectations of him actually implementing taxes the non-paid taxes and the tax released to the operation of the country represents 20% of the national budget yearly. So uh, it's a neoliberal government. It's going to be a continuation of the Lasso government. And in that sense, we expect little on the economic front, or at least inclusive economics. It's going to be uh, perhaps an increase of the minimum income, but we're going to have more privatization. He appeared last week uh, at his first meeting in Carondelet with the outgoing president Lasso with a former uh, vice president from the 90s who was the king of privatization. So we mm. expect more neoliberal economics, more privatization, and this will generate more migration and more poverty, more inequality, which in turn may fuel more drug narco economies in the country. Okay, that is not an optimistic prospect. And also, Manuela, if he doesn't deliver on the economy, will we see a return to the massive protests of last year? That's another tension that's already emerging. Uh, the president of the National Confederation of Indigenous Peoples, Leonidas Issa, already made some demands clearly on the table. The president said he, the elected president of Boa said he had his own agendas. So there's some tensions between the Konai, uh, the indigenous movement, and the coming president. And we know that Konai is very strong uh, and has requests regarding neoliberalism and inclusive economics. Uh, Esteban, are you on the same page there as far as the as far as the economy is concerned? And and the fact that um, the the opposition has now said they will be on side with him. They're so willing to work with him going forward, as long as he doesn't privatize state resources. That was one of the uh, one of the conditions that Luis, Luis Gonzalez had said. Can he promise that? Manuela doesn't seem to think so. Can, what do you think? I think that um, that promise is going to be happening. Uh, although Manuela thinks different. Uh, privatization, uh, it's a historic main issue here in Ecuador. And when you say that in the common public, everybody just uh, jump off their uh, seats. Uh, that's gonna be the main blocking uh, uh, theme between uh, the presidents and the legis legislative branch. But also Daniel Novoa has claimed that 
uh, he's going to be uh, issue, issuing um, one uh, economical law per month. Uh, that's the, the urgent laws that he can present to the uh, legislative branch in order to uh, uh, reorganize the economy. There are not, uh, so far, there are not themes around the, uh, these, these uh, economical uh, laws that he's going to be issuing. But uh, privatization is not going to be on the table, I think. But uh, another themes like uh, jobs, like new entrepreneurs, and international investment are going to be happening. Manuela, are you convinced? Uh, I, I'm not convinced, no, but I hope he does uh, all of the investments. I think it's not just about him deciding to do investments. Ecuador is a country that has very little economic opportunities, that is now marked by narco violence. So it's, uh, and has a very high risk for investment internationally. So it's not easy to attract international investments. There's not a lot of motivation. It's a dollarized economy. Right, that's, that has very little competitive advantage in the region compared to Colombia, to Peru, even to Brazil. So it's a hard case to make, and I hope he will make the case. Then the other thing he needs is a majority in Congress. He only has 10% of seats in Congress, so he needs to do solid alliances and constructive alliances with other parties in Congress to be able to govern uh, these economic proposals forward. Hmm. Uh, Manuel, I'm also curious. I, I want to talk a little bit further about you believing that he will work, that this will be a continuation, and that you've said he will work closely with the opposition uh, going forward. And, and judging fairly from the concession speech of, of Luisa Gonzalez, it sounds like they're ready to be partners. But is there something maybe a little cynical or, or nefarious in that cooperation? Uh, I think they're, they're, they have been collaborating in the past. Uh, his family's Banana Empire has in concession the port of Posorje, which is one of the main ports of Ecuador. And it was granted in concession to his family by the government of Rafael Correa in 2016. So they're not enemies per se. Uh, Novoa organized a trip last year. He was in Congress and he organized a trip to Russia with a lot of Correa Congress members. So they have been working together. The head of the Revolución Ciudadana, Correa's party, has left the party and joined Noboa's uh, movement. Uh, yesterday, I think she announced it. So we do have signs of collaboration between the members, and there, there's a history of collaboration, so they could very well be doing it. It does not mean it's going to be inclusive policies. It does not mean it's not going to generate more immigration and inequality in Ecuador. Mm. Esteban, quickly, do you see, do you think that collaboration that Manuela foresees bodes well or bodes poorly for the Ecuadorian people? Yes, this collaboration is not going to be new. Also yesterday, another political party at the Congress, Partido Social Cristiano, just announced that uh, are going to be joining the political party of Daniel Novoa. Uh, and all the independent uh, congressmen are gonna be joining those uh, that that party too. So I think that collaboration is not gonna be new between uh, Korea's political party and Daniel Novoa's political party. Uh, actually, there's a, 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 another political party called Construye, uh, whose former leader is uh, Maria Paula Romo, ex um, minister of Ecuador in the presidency of Lenin Moreno who is taking a part of those of that uh, big alliance, uh, probably that uh, big alliance. So I think that collaboration is going to be happening. Okay. But to bring security, and, and uh, Esteban, because you've been so tuned into the security issues, I'll say, as, as an analyst here, I'd like to know what you think genuinely can happen as far as really cracking down on any of the narco traffickers that are active in Ecuador, because most often we see the cases that the narco traffickers do work with politicians. They compromise a lot of sometimes, often the top politicians. Do you think Noboa and whomever is going to be in charge going forward will be clean enough to really take on the narco traffickers and reduce that violence in the country? One of the things that Daniel Loa claimed at the campaign was that he's going to be blocking all narco traffickers or uh, gun traffickers here in Ecuador. Uh, 
there's no signs of who's going to be uh, leading that initiative uh, of his team, of, 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 of like a member of, of his team. But uh, Novoa must be clean enough in order to detain all the trafficking. Um, the international collaboration is going to be fundamental in this uh, theme. Like yesterday, uh, he, he actually he is traveling around Europe and uh, he is getting some international advices in order to uh, stop the trafficking. But uh, I think that now Ecuador, what uh, what Ecuador needs is a person who is not only clean, but who also uh, knows how to do things like in security. Okay. But um, it's hard yeah. to, 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 to prevent something, but he must be clean enough. Esteban, that will have to be the final word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all both of my panelists really so much for being with us. Thank Great you. to have you both and uh, our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.